yesterday. We spoke at Pampas Rovar. about the pastimes of Lord Ram, Lakshman, residing here where we sit, Kishkinda Kshetra, along with the Banaras, headed by Sugriva, Hanuman, Jambavan. When Hanuman returned from Sri Lanka and presented to Lord Ram the jewel that was given to him by Sita and her message of love in separation, Lord Sri Ram embraced Hanuman and in doing so fulfilled all of Hanuman's deepest desires. Just as Srila Prabhupada writes in Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita that Krishna doesn't see the thing that is offered but he sees the intention Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam in Urupi where we will be going tomorrow one Palimar Matswami, the late Acharya of that Mat. He offered Krishna during his Parayaya, or the time when he was um, worshipping the deity of Lord Krishna. A crown that was made completely of diamonds. And some media people were criticizing him. Why don't you give that money to poor people? Why don't you use it to feed the poor and give medicine to the poor, give clothes to the poor? And he explained, anywhere a leader of a nation goes, Every day, how much do they spend? It's not long ago, I was at a very small event where I met the President of the United States. And as I was approaching this home, there were so many police cars all around. And then when I came to the home, there was so much security that was set up at this, somebody's home. And after going through the security, which was very simple because only a few people were invited, even though there was only a few people there, all around the house, there were these people with suits and ties and little things in their ears and sunglasses and they always had their hand somewhere hidden or you couldn't see what they were holding sometimes and they were everywhere and they didn't talk to anybody they were just watching so many so I went to one of them and I just asked them you know who are, who are you and who are you? 
how are you doing? <laughs> and he didn't know what to do because nobody ever talks to these people. <laughs> so he didn't look at me and he didn't say anything. And I didn't see what he was looking at because he had sunglasses, sunglasses on. So I kept talking to him. <laughs> and finally, he said, talk to him. So I went to another person, and they took me to the supervisor of all these secret agents, or agents, whatever they were, security. And he was really nice to me. He was telling me about how many people, and he was telling, I, he was telling me about the security, how many police cars there were around, and in behind the house, there was, there was an ocean. And we, he showed me there were four boats. Two were police boats, and two were um, like FBI, or not FBI, but Secret Service boats. And then there was a helicopter up above. And he said, what you don't see is right there. And he pointed to the water. He said, there's an armed submarine. So I was thinking, so much security. And the president was only going to be there for two hours. And he had three events that day. So that means all that security is going to be at every event he goes to. That means there's literally millions of dollars spent every day just on security purposes. So Palayamar Matswami said, Anyone, anywhere a president or a prime minister goes, they spend millions of dollars a day just on arrangements and security. When President Clinton came to Mumbai, they gave him an entire floor of a five-star hotel. How much is that worth? What to speak of the security? And they closed the main road of the whole town for a whole day. So he said, Krishna, he's not just the president or prime minister of one nation. He's the supreme lord of all the countries, of the entire world, of all the planets, entire, of the entire universe of all the innumerable universes in the cosmic manifestation. So if once in 12 years we give him a nice crown, why are you complaining? You see, when we offer to Krishna, it is like offering water to the root of the tree. If Krishna is satisfied, he can make everything happy and everyone happy. But whether we offer Krishna a diamond crown or a chickpea, <laughs> if it's offered with love and devotion, Krishna's happy because he accepts our intent. And for a devotee, everything in this world is just that. The only value anything in this world has is to the extent we could use it to please Krishna. Arts, music, intelligence, architecture, strength, things, all of these things, if we understand that they're Krishna's energy and they're seen as a facility to use for Krishna, they all have eternal value. Srila Prabhupada was speaking in a microphone. He said, this is spiritual energy. This microphone is beyond any price when we use it to please Krishna by speaking his glories and sharing them with others. Otherwise, it's just a piece of metal which really 
has no value whatsoever for the eternal soul. So the way we speak, the way we smile, the way we look, the way we talk, the way we utilize whatever we may have, if our consciousness is to please Krishna, every single detail is so precious. And similarly, Krishna embraced Hanuman. What is an embrace? Putting your arms around someone. It only lasts a couple seconds. But it was the intent. That embrace was a gesture of Krishna to his devotee that I'm satisfied with you. I am so pleased with you. I am your property. And for Hanuman, his jumping across the ocean, his burning Sri Lanka, his mighty roar, it wasn't just a show of strength. It was all just his ways of expressing his gratitude and his love and his will to serve Lord Ram. So this is bhakti. Everything of this world has its potential sacredness if we understand the truth of why it's created. It's not created for us to enjoy. It's created for us to utilize for service. And through the association of devotees, through our sadhana, through our prayer, and through our practice, we develop this view of the world. Hanumanji then explained to Ram all the details about the layout of Sri Lanka and how the military was organized. Because there was going to be a great war. And although Sri Ram Chandra, he's the source of the Virat Rupa. He could easily just manifest this universal form and just with one glance burn Sri Lanka to ashes. But that's not going to melt our hearts with love for him. The same way as when he performs his Ram Leela. And although he's all powerful, his opulence of renunciation or detachment is he accepts a position like a human being. And he facilitates depending on Hanuman and the Vanaras to assist him. So Ram jumped on Hanuman's shoulder, Lakshman jumped on Angada's shoulder, and Hanuman and Angada jumped to the shore of the Southern Ocean. Meanwhile, in Sri Lanka, <clears throat> just recently, Hanuman had burned a major part of the whole city. And before he left, he roared his message. Return Sita, or millions of monkeys, as powerful as me, a lord along with Ram and Lakshman from whom we gain all our powers, are going to come to destroy your own, your whole dynasty. So Ravana called a very spurious, serious assembly of all of his leaders, his 
ministers, relatives, generals. And he told them that we see what this one monkey has done to Sri Lanka. Now there's going to be millions of them marching in, along with Ram and Lakshman. And they are demanding that I give Sita back. But I will not give Sita. I've already given my heart to her. And I will not take it back. She will be mine. I will never give up and succumb to anyone's demands. Srila Prabhupada gives so many nice instructions. Srimad Bhagavatam. He says, even the greatest conquerors, they go out and conquer lands and empires, but then they come home and they're conquered by their mind and senses for lustful enjoyment. That is why in the Vedic culture, or a real spiritual culture, people who can control their senses are considered to be real conquerors. And they are offered respect. We see how Dasarat Maharaj bowed his head to Vishwamitra Muni. And throughout the great Puranas, Mahabharat, Ramayana, we find even kings, how they bow down to those sages, rishis, Vaishnavas, who have no selfish desires. That's the greatest power. Because that power of humble service conquers the ego and ultimately conquers the heart of the Supreme Lord. But Ravana, he was so proud, so arrogant. He proclaimed, I'm willing to fight to death but I will not give up Sita. So now let us plan how we're going to fight this war. One of the generals said, why don't you just forcibly enjoy Sita? Why are you harassing her and waiting and waiting and waiting? Ram told them all a lie. He said, Sita promised me after one year she would surrender to me and accept me as her husband. But Ram wants to come before that year has expired. There's only one month left. They said, why don't you force him? Ravana said, I can't. Because years before, he disclosed a secret that very few people knew about. There was an apsara named Ramba. And Ravana went to violate her chastity. And that caused so much pain to her husband, Nalakuvera, that he was cursed. And that curse came from such a pained place in her husband's heart that even Lord Brahma confirmed the curse. That if ever he tried to enjoy a woman against her will, he would immediately die. So he explained, we will fight this war to the end and we will be victorious. So all the generals, they were so clouded in illusion 
and they just wanted to tell Ravana what Ravana wanted to hear. Prahasta was the commander-in-chief. He said, I could single-handedly destroy every monkey, including Hanuman. What to speak of Ram and Lakshman? Just order me and I'll go and devastate them all immediately, right now. I have my bow in my hand. Just give me the order. He said, the only reason why Hanuman was able to do what he did is because we were, we were not expecting him. He took us by surprise. If we were prepared, I would have single-handedly destroyed that useless monkey in a moment. Just give me the order. He was roaring. And then another of the great generals, Mahodahar, he stood up and he said the same thing. Ravana, you have defeated Indra. You have nothing to fear. No one could stand before you in battle. You are the supreme, ultimate strength in this universe. And with your powers, just give me the order, I will single-handedly wipe them all out. And Ravana was becoming really excited to hear all these people speak. <laughs> then Kumbhakarna spoke. Kumbhakarna was Ravana's very big little brother. <laughs> when he spoke, he roared. He was gigantic. He said, Ravana, why are you asking our advice now? Why didn't you ask our advice before you kidnapped Sita? Don't you know it's completely against religious principles to steal another man's wife when he's not around the way you did? You don't have any of the strength of Dharma behind you. Because of the weakness of your mind and senses you did this, why didn't you ask us before? What you did is a condemned deed. You deserve to suffer. But because I'm your brother, Whatever you've done in the past, however wicked and wrong it was, I will destroy them. So Ravana was insulted but very happy. <laughs> and then all of them were standing up and telling how great they were and how powerful they were and how Ravana was undefeatable and there was nothing to worry about. Let the armies come of the monkeys. We are prepared. And sitting on the other side of Ravana, from, Vibhi, from Kumbhakarna, was Vibhishan, the youngest brother. And he stood up. He said, all these people who are speaking, Ravana, they don't know anything about the truth. They're just totally infatuated and intoxicated by their false egos and therefore they cannot see what's before them. One monkey has destroyed our kingdom. Ravana is the supreme Lord Vishnu. Just by his glance he could destroy you. You took his pleasure potency, Sita. He's going to destroy you. Give back Sita. I love my relatives. Ravana, you're my brother. I love you. I'm telling you the truth with, pa with, with passion and compassion. Give back Sita or everything we value in life is going to be lost. But all these generals, they are all speaking what you want them to speak because of their arrogance and because their fear of you and because you give them so many favors. But real love is to speak the truth even when it's unpalatable for the welfare of another. Ravana was very upset. Indrajit 
the eldest son of Ravana. He was furious. He started screaming at his uncle Vibhishan. How could you call yourself a Rakshasha? Rakshashas are named for their are, are known for their heroism and valor and fearlessness. You are a coward. You have taken shelter of the enemy. My father, he has nothing to fear from these humans or monkeys. I myself, with my arrow and my clubs and javelins, can destroy them all. Shame on you. You're not fit to be my uncle. You're not fit to be in this family. You're simply a coward. Indrajit said, I mean, Vibhishan told Indrajit, you are a fool. <laughs> so young and so ignorant and so arrogant. You don't know. You call yourself the son of your father, but you are his worst enemy. Ravana, Sita is like a poisonous snake that you have wrapped around your own neck. And the beauty of Sita is the poison that's going to kill you. She belongs to Ram. Give her back. Ravana was so upset. He stood up from his elegant throne and screamed, roared at Vibhisha. You, although my brother, have taken the side of my enemy. Therefore, you are to be killed. I would kill you at this moment. But because you're my brother, I will not do that. But I reject you. Everything you have, I have given you. I have ruled over the kingdom that you have resided in your whole life with valor, with valor and bravery. And look what I have done from all the citizens, but you have no gratitude. Out of fear, you have taken shelter of my enemy. Therefore, I reject you. He spoke so harshly to Vibhishan. Vibhishan's heart was broken because he really cared. But there was just nothing he could do. So by his own mystic powers, his body rose. And four of his associates rose with him. Vibhishan he said, with a very broken and sad heart, I leave you, Ravana. You will be destroyed because of your own arrogance and lust and greed. And then he said a loving but compassionate goodbye to Ravana. And he and his four assistants crossed over the ocean. The monkeys, they saw these four gigantic, five gigantic rakshashas in the sky. And Vibhishan said, bring me your leader. Sugriva came with Hanuman. They looked up and Vibhishan said, I am the brother of Ravana. I have ordered, I have instructed him, I have pleaded with him to give Sita back, but he will not. I have come to take shelter of Ram. Bring me to Ram. Sugriva ran to Lord Ram and said, there is these five Rakshashas who have come. One is the brother of Ravana. He says he wants to take shelter of you. 
He wants to join us. We should kill him. We can't trust him. He's a rakshasha. We should punish him, we should imprison him, or we should kill him, but he must be rejected. Because after all, if we put any confidence in him, he could cause havoc to our whole army. Ram asked the opinion of some of the other monkey leaders, and they all had more or less the same opinion as Sugriva. He should be, at the most, killed. At the least, he should be imprisoned, punished, and rejected. Hanuman was quiet. Ram asked Hanuman, what do you think? Hanuman said, I saw Vibhishan's face, and I heard the tone of his voice. I have complete trust in his sincerity. He's come to take shelter of you. We should accept him as one of our brothers in our family and put our full faith in him. I saw. When I was face to face with Ravana, Ravana was about to kill me and Vibhishan argued like fire to spare my life. He's here devotee. He's come to surrender. Give him your mercy. Ram said, yes, bring Vibhishan. I will give him my full shelter. Sugriva was really upset. Because after all, he's the commander-in-chief, he's in charge of all the armies, he has to deal with everything. We have seen sometimes the people who actually manage projects, they become very disturbed when a leader gives some instructions that are very difficult. That they, The leader goes away, but they have to deal with it. So Sugriva said, no, this is insane. Well, well, what are you saying, Anuman, Ram? He, he, he's Ravana's brother. They have the same blood. They're the sons of Vishada. He might have gotten in a family quarrel with Ravana now, and he's angry and he's serious. But when it really comes to the point of you dying or Ravana dying, he's going to take the side of his brother. We can't trust him. And that is when Ram proclaimed, that it is my solemn vow, that anyone who even once, with a sincere heart, says, my dear Lord, I am yours. I will give that person complete shelter and protection for the rest of eternity. Even if Ravana were to come before me today to seek shelter, I would accept him. Bring Vibhishan now. Vibhishan came down to the ground with tears of humility in his eyes, and he bowed down at the feet of Lord Sri Ramchandra. And he expressed his heart. I'm your devotee. I have seen the misery and suffering that my brother has put your, your eternal consort, your loving wife, Sita, in. And I've begged him and pleaded with him but he's so obsessed with his arrogant ways, he will not listen to anyone. I'm with you, Ram. I know everything about the Rakshashas. I know all their strengths and all their weaknesses. I'll tell you everything. Ram was so pleased. He picked up Vibhishan and embraced him. 
Then he told Lakshman, go get water from the sea. And with that water on Ram's command, Lakshman performed an Abhishek and consecrated Vibhishan as the king of Sri Lanka. After Vibhishan was telling Ram all oh, very, very crucial information about Ravana's armies and about his fortress, they looked out at the sea. And in those days, what we now call the Indian Ocean, it was a massive sea. It was 800 miles, 100 yojanas to Sri Lanka. And there were huge waves. Ram asked Vibhishan, how should we cross the ocean with all of our armies? Vibhishan told Ram that your family, the Ikshvaku or Solar Dynasty, has a very special connection with the Lord of the Ocean. Perform meditation on the seashore and ask the God of the sea himself how you could cross him. Lord Ram, who is Parameshwar, the supreme controller of all controllers, out of such humility to respect and honor the position of Samudra, the Lord of the sea, he put a kusha grass mat down in the sand and sat in meditation and prayer for three days fasting. After three days, Sri Ram manifested disappointment and anger. Disappointment that he was, according to dharma, with humble respect, trying to give honor to the Lord of the sea, even though he didn't have to. But his anger was to teach Samudra and all the rest of us a good lesson. The Lord's anger is not like our anger. When the Lord becomes angry, it's out of love, it's out of compassion, it's to make a very strong statement for everyone's benefit. Ram turned to Lakshman and said, I have been patient, I have been humble, I have been very respectful, and Samudra, because he's such a big, big demigod with such wealth and all the sea and everything else, he's not giving any attention to me. In this world where people are so selfish, so much in the bodily and mental conceptions of life, they consider humility and respect and good manners to be a sign of weakness. When people are harsh and haughty and pushy, that's considered a strong person. If this is the only language that he understands, then see what I will do. And Ram's eyes became red like coals. And it appeared that just by his glance, he was going to burn the universe to ashes. And then he took an arrow to his bow. It became many arrows. And they were flaming. And they entered into the ocean. And they were so empowered with heat that the whole ocean started boiling. There were massive, gigantic waves. 
and whales and Tim and Gilla fish and all kinds of other creatures were screaming and jumping, trying to get out, out of the ocean and coming back and jumping out. And at that point, Samudra Dev, the personified deity of the ocean, he came out with folded palms and beautiful jewels to offer to Ram. And he said, please forgive me, but it's, it's my nature. You know how oceans are, we're very uncrossable. <laughs> Even these great demigods, yesterday we spoke about Indra, Samudra. They're great, great personalities. They're great devotees. But the power of material nature is it can distract us and cause us to forget. And that forgetfulness is when we think that I'm the doer, I'm the proprietor. And the great devotees of the Lord when they offer prayers, that's their prayer, that they never fall victim to being the enjoyer, the proprietor, the doer. Their prayer is always to be the servant of the servant of the servant, which means to recognize our true position. But Lord Ram, for these great, great personalities like Samudra, knows what he has to do to remind them. Samudra told Ram that I will facilitate building a bridge across my ocean. Nala and Nila, two of your great monkey generals, they are the sons of Vishwakarma. And Nala especially, he's empowered by his father with the same abilities. Put him as the chief engineer for this project. And there will be no impediment. So when Nala got this order from Ram, he became very, very enthusiastic. And he started giving all these orders to all the other monkeys in the army to get stones and to get trees and to get vines to tie them all together to build a bridge. And everyone was so enthusiastic because time was the essence. So they were jumping all over the world getting rocks and mountains and they were piling them up all at the seashore. And meanwhile, Ravana, he had spies disguising themselves like monkeys going over to see what was happening and they were coming back and reporting to him. They were taking, according to each of their capacity, they were all helping to build the bridge. About one-fifth of the bridge was built in the first day. It's, it's 800 miles across. It took five days to build the bridge. And as they were building it, Hanuman, it was his inspiration that Ram is non-different than his name. Because yogis are always performing the recitation of mantras especially the mystics. And if we see, even in the Puranic times or those of Ramayana, even the great warriors, they chant special mantras to invoke certain powers. Hanumanji, he had total faith that the supreme mantra is the name of God. Just the name Ram is perfect and complete in itself. Everything is included. Put the name of Ram, whether it's on a little stone or a massive mountain peak, it will float. 
but it's not only floating because the ocean has all these giant waves and everything. So how to keep them all together, even if they're floating? They were getting huge vines from all over the areas and they were trying to tie it all together, tie all the rocks together. But Hanuman's wisdom, the name of Ram, if we make that the center, then it unites all of us. So all of the stones floated and all of the stones were united in the name of Ram. There's one interesting story where Ram, in his humility, just see the power of my name. It's not a small thing, a bridge made out of rocks and stones and mountain peaks and trees and everything else you could think of that's uh, 80 miles wide and 800 miles long. And it was built in five days. In Mumbai, you know, just that one little bridge that goes from what, Whirly to, where is it? To Bandra. It took about 10 years. <laughs> it's only about five miles, right? And nothing floats. <laughs> it's over the sea, but they had to build all kinds of foundations and everything else. And there's only eight lanes. This is 80 miles wide. So Ram, if my name has this power, what powers I must have? And he went to a secluded place and threw a stone in the sea. And it sank. <laughs> and Hanuman was behind him. And Hanumanji said, my Lord, whoever takes shelter of you and you accept within your hands, they never fall, they never sink. But people who by their own free will want to leave you and they leave from the shelter of your hands, immediately they will sink. So when you let go of these stones, they sank but because you're non different than your name, wherever your name is chanted with sincerity, you will never let your devotees fall. So um, Ram was very happy. And there's that famous story of the little squirrel, some say spider. Maybe there were both. <laughs> But the squirrel jumped out of the water and he was all wet and he rolled in the sand and then he came out and he shook his hairs and was putting little grains of sand on the, on the rocks. That was his contribution. Hanumanji was holding mountain peaks and he was giving a grain of sand. And Ram told Hanuman, to Hanuman's great happiness, he said, the squirrel is doing as much as you. To me, a grain of sand in a mountain, there's no difference. It's the devotion. He's doing the best he could do. And this is the beautiful thing about bhakti. You see, in this material world, there's so many categories of skills and intelligence and wealth and abilities and all of these things that create such inequality. But in bhakti, it's not at all dependent on what we know or what we can do or what we have. It's dependent on our sincerity to please Krishna. Srila Prabhupada, he tells a story about that old Bengali widow. 
actually in November, there is going to be a very auspicious event at Radha Gopinath Temple. I think it's on the 14th or 16th. It's on a Sunday, but our very dear God sister and one of the most beloved disciples of Srila Prabhupada, Yamuna Devi. Srila Prabhupada took her physically from the world a few years ago. But before she passed from this world, she wrote a book of her memories of Srila Prabhupada. And her very dear associates, Dina Tarani Devi, Kartama Shaprabhu, and others help to complete this book. And it's going to be released at Radha Gopinath Temple in November. And she talks about this old Bengali widow because she was there. Srila Prabhupada spoke about her in some of his lectures, but Yamuna Devi used to talk to her. She was good friends with her. She was a very simple lady. She didn't have much education. She had no money. She was very old. She was not very healthy. But every morning she would come with a, with a pot of water that she would personally collect from the river Yamuna and just present it to the pujaris to use for Radhadamadar service. Early every morning, she didn't make any um, introduction to herself. She would just quietly come and put the pot of water down and leave. Nobody knew she existed, except Radha Damodar. And Srila Prabhupada, from his room, he used to see her come and just put the water down. And he, it moved him so much. He used her as an example of a true saint. She was doing what she could do for Krishna's pleasure. So whether you're Hanuman or whether you're a squirrel, we all have equal opportunity to attain the perfection of life. And we shouldn't get bewildered by the false ego and start comparing ourselves to others on the basis of material results. Because then we become depressed. Or we become envious. Or we become arrogant. To actually see that quality in ourselves and see that quality in others. It's our humility our sincerity in our will to please the Lord and follow the Lord in our Guru's teachings with an earnest heart. That's all important. So all the monkeys, and Hanumanji was so intelligent, he even got the fish. He engaged them all in Ram service underneath the ocean, even the little fish, they were contributing things to the bridge so that everyone could go back home, back to Godhead. It's not that Hanumanji was thinking, look at me, what I'm doing. He was doing everything he, would do, he could do, but he was appreciating the squirrel, he was appreciating a fish who was under the rocks, just pushing it up. Ram doesn't need the fish. Ram doesn't need Hanuman. <laughs> but we need to serve. And Ram makes it that he needs that little squirrel in Hanuman. Because that's the nature of his spirit to appreciate. And this is very important. that we learn to appreciate. It's a great virtue. And when we appreciate people's spiritual qualities, and we, when we appreciate whatever efforts they're making sincerely to serve, 
that appreciation is actually an expression of our will to love Krishna. And Krishna will reciprocate. Anyone can criticize. But to appreciate. Srila Prabhupada appreciated even people who had no dharma or anything. If they just had the slightest desire to connect with Krishna in any way, he would appreciate that so much. And by doing that, he would bring the best out in everyone. After the bridge was complete, Hanuman welcomed Ram on his shoulder. Angada welcomed Lakshman, and they very quickly marched across the ocean. And what a sight that was. The monkeys were really enthusiastic. They were jumping, they were leaping, they were howling in ecstasy because they were about to fight for Ram. Didn't matter if they lived or died, they were gonna fight for Ram. To bring Sita back to Ram. They all saw the pangs of Ram's heart. They all heard from Hanupan the pangs in Sita's heart. Their only purpose in life was to reunite Sita Ram. And they were so enthusiastic with the challenge. What was gonna happen? What kind of war? They, they had heard from Bibishan about the unbelievable, incredible armies of Ravana. In Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a purport where Srila Prabhupada explains. Ravana had millions and millions of soldiers. They were trained warriors. They were mystic yogis. And they had the most highly sophisticated weapons to fight with. And in Ram's army, the whole army, there were only two weapons. Ram and Lakshman both had bows and arrows. None of the monkeys had anything. Doesn't even say in Ramayana, as far as I remember, that Hanuman even had his club then. They were just picking up trees and rocks and throwing and their teeth and their nails and their fists and their knees. <laughs> but they were fearless. Here they were. They were confronting the most powerful army and arsenal in the entire universe that conquered Indra. And they were fearless and all they had was their enthusiasm to serve. And Srila Prabhupada wrote that this was Ram's arrangement. He wanted to show, even if you make all the best possible material arrangements, if you're not on the side of Dharma, if you're not on the side of Ram, it's just a matter of time till you lose everything. The monkeys had that faith. And when they reached over to Sri Lanka, they were ready. And Ravana was ready. And the battle began. I would just like to cite one or two very well-known incidents of Hanumanji's incredible devotion. Throughout the battle of Sri Lanka, Hanuman was always right there. His enthusiasm to serve everywhere, everyone, But at one time, 
Prahasta was killed, the commander in chief by Nala, who just threw a rock on his head. <laughs> Prahasta's got chariot and horses and charioteers and armies all over him and he's shooting weapons and chanting mantras and has javelins and clubs and all kinds of nuclear things and Prahasta and Nala just takes a rock and throws it on his head. <laughs> Ravana was shocked. And so many others, same thing was happening. And finally, it was getting so bad that Ravana said, wake up Kumbhakarna. Now in one sense, this was a very good thing, but another, it was a mistake. Because Kumbhakarna, the demigods approached Brahma when he was give, giving benedictions to Ravana and Suparnaka and Vibhishan and Ravana, and Ravana was getting all kinds of powers where he couldn't be killed by anybody who could possibly be a threat to him. But he didn't say humans or monkeys because they, they were below his dignity to even mention their names. And he was getting all the yogic cities and he was getting long lives and he was, he cut off his head, it grows back, cut off his arms, grows back. He was getting all these incredible boons from Brahma that he could conquer the universe. And Vibhishan, he performed tapasya also. And the only blessing he asked for is to always remember his beloved Lord and to always please his beloved Ram by being the servant of the servant of the servant of his servants. That's the only blessing. Vibhishan could have asked for the same things as Ravana, but he was self-satisfied. He was a devotee. Brahma asked Kumbhakarna, what benediction do you want? Because they did thousands of years of severe tapasya. And the demigods went to Brahma and said, even without any benedictions, he's, he's so giant and so cruel, he just eats everything and everyone. If he has any blessings, if you just leave him as he is, he will exterminate all life in the universe by eating everything. So give him the... So Brahma arranged for Goddess Saraswati to come into his mouth. And Brahma said, what benediction would you like? And Saraswati spoke through his mouth, sleep. <laughs> Brahma said, so be it. <laughs> Kumbhakarna said, I didn't mean to say that. How did that happen? But it was too late. So he would sleep for six months and then he'd be awake for one day. And in that one day, he would eat what people can't eat in thousands of years. <laughs> then he'd go to sleep. But in that one day, he was totally indestructible and undefeatable. But the day of his being awake, he already chastised Ravana. That was the day when he held his court. But now it was an emergency. So Ravana said, wake up Kumbhakarna. And there's a whole story in Valmiki Ramayana of how they had to wake him up. <laughs> but eventually he woke up. But he was vulnerable because it was his sleeping time. And ultimately Ram vanquished Kumbhakarna. Ravana could not believe this. He sent some of his other sons who were really great heroes and they were vanquished. So now Ravana is really becoming depressed and his own wife Mandodari is saying, just give back Sita, look, all of our children are being killed, your brother is being killed, your other brother is betrayed, just give back. Ram, Ravana could not listen. He was really becoming 
depressed. But then Indrajit, the most powerful of everyone in Sri Lanka, he spoke with such confidence that today I will destroy Ram and Sita will be yours. And Raman, yes, Ravana said yes. And he had great confidence in Indrajit. Indrajit went to a temple where he performed his puja. It's very interesting. Even in those days, these demons, these demons were really powerful. Even if they hated God, they got their power from demigods. <laughs> in other words, in those days, all of them, they all had this sense that there's higher personal powers than ourselves. And by pleasing these personal powers, we can get these powers. So Indrajit went to perform a yagya to Agni Dev. And he was an extremely intense personality. He was performing this yagya. He already had such incredible supernatural powers and he somehow got the favor of Brahma. And he was given a special Brahmastra, a weapon of Brahma that had to be victorious and could not be counteracted. And he came into the battlefield and by his supernatural yogic abilities, Indrajit was invisible. And his weapons were invisible. And they were the weapons of Agni and the weapons of Brahma. And he had massive armies around him. And the armies were fighting, and all the monkeys were fighting with the, with the army of, of Indrajit. But there were these arrows and clubs and axes and javelins and everything showering down and they couldn't sing Indraja to fight back and they couldn't even see the weapons to counteract them and they were, they were just, they were being crushed. Jambavan was unconscious laying in the ground. Angada was practically dead. Sugriva was laying there. Nala and Nila and Within a short amount of time, the monkeys, they were just trying to look, where is this, where are the weapons coming from? We can't even see the weapons. We can't even see the person. How do you fight somebody like this? It was impossible. After some time, the entire army of the monkeys was laying unconscious. Totally covered with Indrajit's weapons. And he was just laughing. And then he attacked Ram and Lakshman. And they were where to fight. <laughs> they were being covered by these arrows. And Ram told Lakshman, we have to honor Lord Brahma. Brahma gave them benediction, Indrajit, that his weapon would not fail, that it would be victorious, that nothing could counteract it. So let us just tolerate. And soon Ram and Lakshman were covered by arrows and were laying on the battlefield unconscious. Indrajit looked down there was only a few monkeys left. They were just the foot soldiers. He didn't care about them. All the generals, all the powerful people in Ram and Lakshman, as far as he could see, they were all dead. So he took his invisible chariot and he went back to the place where he was going to continue his worship to get even greater powers. But first he went and told Ravana, my dear father, the work is done. Enjoy Sita. Ram and Lakshman are dead. And that crazy monkey's dead. They're all dead. 
and Ravana was so happy. And he reported to Sita, you see, they're all dead. Sita was in pain. But one of the Rakshachi women, Trijata, and Vibhishan's wife, Sharala, informed Sita, actually, they're not dead. They're just sleeping for some time. <laughs> but anyways, Hanuman and Vibhishan, they were wounded, but Hanuman couldn't be killed. Vibhishan, Indrajit, because Indrajit is Vibhishan's brother, he just like threw this javelin through his shoulder and he was laying there wrapped with pain, but he didn't die. But he was looking for Hanuman because he knew Hanuman couldn't be killed. And he found Hanuman. And Vibhishan said, we have to go find Jambavan. And it's night. So they had a torch. And they're going through the battlefield, somehow or other, looking for Jambavan. And there's millions. I think, according to Valmiki Ramayan, I think that night, Indrajit defeated 67 crores of monkeys. He was a powerful warrior. <laughs> they were all laying there. They all seemed dead. And they're going through all these bodies. And finally, they came to Jambavan. And Jambavan was, in, he was old and he was covered with these, wet, with these javelins and axes and arrows of Indrajit. He was in so much pain. He was laying there. And Vibhishan said, you know, Jambavan, we're searching for you. And Jambavan said, I'm in so much pain, I can't even see, but I can hear your voice. But just tell me one thing. Where is Hanuman? Vibhishan was really surprised by that question. He said, why are you asking about Hanuman? Why are you not asking about Ram? <laughs> you're not asking about Ram, why are you asking Hanuman? And Jambavan said, because if, if Hanuman is alive, whoever is dead with us will come alive. But if Hanuman is dead, we will all die. Bring Hanuman. But Hanuman was standing right there. And Hanumanji, so humble to his superior, Jambavan, Hanuman fell at Jambavan's feet and put his feet on his, on his head. And he, Hanumanji said to Jambavan, how may I serve? Jambavan said, you are the only one who could save us. Ram has empowered you. It is his will. Ram and Lakshman are not dead. They are just honoring Brahma's weapon. But they're unconscious. <laughs> and when Ram came to consciousness and saw Lakshman laying there, he was crying. Jambavan told Hanumanji, that you have to go immediately to the Himalayas. There is a mountain in the Himalayas called Rishab. And from the peak of Rishab mountain, you will see Mount Kailash. In between, there is an incredible mountain that has light like fire. There, it's endowed with supernatural healing herbs. From that mountain, you must get four herbs. The Sanjeevani Karana, the Vishalya Karana, Sanjeevani Karana can bring dead people back to life. Vishalya Karani can heal any type of wound in a body. The Suvarana Karani can restore the body to its 
full strength and vigor. And the sandhani can heal and join all bones that are broken and dislocated. He said, you must get these four herbs and bring them back. And not only Ram and Lakshman, but the entire monkey army will come back to life and have full strength. But you have to do it immediately. By tomorrow, it will be too late. So Hanumanji went to the top of Trikuta Mountain and cried out, Jai Shri Ram. Jai Shri Ram. Jai Shri Ram. Jumped. Jumped across the ocean. He went past Kishkinda Kshetra, the Vindhya Mountains, Dandakaranya Forest. He was going over and he came to the highest peaks of the Himalayas. And there on Rishab Hill, Rishab Mountain, he saw Kailash, the abode of Shiva. And between was often called the Ganda Madana Mountain. He went to get the herbs, but somehow or other, all the herbs entered into the mountain. They were all being hidden. So Hanuman couldn't find them, and he didn't have time to really start digging and searching, because time was the essence. So Hanumanji, nothing could impede his devotional service. That was the power of his enthusiasm. In the material sense, there's a saying, where there is a will, there's a way. But in devotional service, when we take shelter of the Lord with a determined enthusiasm to serve, Krishna can empower us to do incredible things. One time, my dear God brother, Vishnu Jan Swami Maharaj, he asked Srila Prabhupada that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he could have spread the holy name into every town and village. That's what Nityananda and he predicted. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur was such a great saint, he could have spread the holy name to every town and village. Why didn't they do it? They had all powers. And Srila Prabhupada, very humble, he said, because they saved that service for me. And Srila Prabhupada never took credit for anything. If you want to understand what is the essence of Srimad Bhagavatam, what is the essence of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita in a practical way in which we could have the, the consciousness of living in this world, we just study the simple prayer that Prabhupada wrote on Jaladuta. Krishna, if you like, you can give me the power to speak to convince them of your message. They are so much, all these people in the Western world and in India and everywhere else are so much under the influence of the modes and passion and ignorance. How will they understand? But if you give me the words by your grace, they will be happy. Just make me your puppet and let me dance as you want me to dance. That's the spirit of Hanuman. He had such determination, there was nothing impossible. Prabhupada used to say, impossible, impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. That was Hanuman's way of seeing the world. What has to be done, has to be done because it's for Ram. I can't find the herbs. Jambavan has already given me the instruction. I must get it back immediately. So Hanuman shook the mountain and took the peak off the mountain. Gigantic peak. Probably weighed millions and millions of tons. And he lifted it up and 
jump back to Sri Lanka. And he came to Vibhishan and Jambavan. And they called Shushena. Jambavan took those herbs. Shushena was the doctor of the monkeys. He took the herbs and put them near the nose of Ram and Lakshman. And they opened their eyes. And they stood up. And Ram embraced Hanumanji. Every single one of the monkeys, they all woke up and all their wounds were healed and their health was completely restored and every single monkey that was killed was brought back to life. But Ramayan explains that so many of Ravana's soldiers died. Why didn't they come back to life? Every single monkey that was killed came back to life because of this herbs that Hanumanji brought from the Himalayas. Because Ravana didn't want the monkeys to think that he was losing. So any Rakshasha that died, other Rakshashas were ordered to throw them in the ocean. So nobody would see that there was any um, deaths so that the uh, monkeys would not feel encouraged that they were making any progress. But you see, his psychology worked against him. They weren't back to life. They were in the ocean. Hanumanji ki On another occasion, Ravana was fighting against Lakshman and threw a special javelin that was endowed with supernatural powers and it struck Lakshman's chest. And he appeared to be dead. Ram was crying. And Hanuman went back to the Himalayas to bring back that same mountain with the same herbs to bring Lakshman back to life. Eventually, Lord Sri Ramchandra defeated Ravana and was victorious. Ram told Vibhishan to perform the last rites for his brother. Vibhishan said, how could I do that? He was such a demon. <laughs> I'm your devotee and he was your enemy. Why should I perform the last rites for him and try to elevate his soul? Ram said, any enmity between us is all only on the physical platform and mental platform. Now that he's dead, it's all gone. Liberate his soul. Perform the last rites. Forgive him. After the last rites of Ravana, Ram told Hanuman, because of you, we are victorious in this battle. Go and give Sita the message that I will soon be sending Vibhishan to bring her to reunite with me. Hanuman was so excited. He entered into Sri Lanka. He met with Sita and gave her the news. Ravana is slain. Ram is victorious. He's waiting for you. Sita began to cry in such ecstasy. For almost 12 months, about 11 months, she was a prisoner of Ravana, 24 hours a day yearning to be reconnected with Ram. Every day he was threatening to kill.
kill her if she didn't surrender. Her heart was over flooding with gratitude. She was praising Hanumanji because you have facilitated my beloved Lord to win this great war and because you have come on behalf of my Lord to give me this news. I shower all my blessings upon you that your devotion, your love, your heroism will live forever in the hearts of all devotees. I give you my heart, I give you my life, Hanuman. Please tell Ram that I'm waiting, waiting for that moment to see him again. So Hanuman jumped over the wall and gave Ram her message. Then Ram told Vibhishan that you and your wife should have her take a nice bath because she didn't bathe the whole time <laughs> and put on beautiful ornaments and clothes and put her on a palanquin to come to see me. Vibhishan and Sharala they gave the news to Sita. She said, I don't want to take a bath. I just want to see Ram. They said, no, no, it is his order. You must. So they did an Abhishek for her, and they put beautiful garments and jewels and placed her in a palaquin and brought her to where Ram was standing. And to everyone's great surprise, It was said that well, maybe everyone should go away so that Ram and Sita could meet privately. And Ram was just looking down and very indifferently said, no, everyone should stay. And Sita came down. Ram didn't even look at her. He was looking at the ground. And he looked not happy at all. And Sita's heart was bursting with the desire to serve, to please, and to be loved by Ram once again. But Ram showed no emotion externally. And while looking at the ground, he said, Sita, you have been touched by another man living with him for 11 months, I cannot take you back now. You could go anywhere you like. Sita burst into tears. Ram wouldn't even look at her. She said, Ram, 24 hours a day, I was only crying in separation. My heart was completely chaste, pure, and faithful to you at every moment. How is it possible that you could have any doubt in me? If you tell me I can go anywhere I want, I will enter fire. If I in any way have displeased you, even for a moment, then I don't want to live. And she told Lakshman, build a pyre and I will enter into the fire. Everyone was looking at Ram and everyone was heartbroken. Everyone was seeing Sita crying and Everyone was crying except Ram. Even Lakshman was angry with Ram. But everyone was afraid to say anything to him because he looked so grave. Ram just indicated to Lakshman, 
make the fire. Lakshman's crying, his heart's breaking. He's, he's taking wood, he builds a fire. Sita circumambulates Ram. Her whole, heart, her whole body is trembling. Her heart is totally broken. Preparing us for the Diwali part. <laughs> and <clears throat> Hanuman, Sukriva, Angara, Vibhishan, they don't know what to say, they don't know what to do. Sita tells Ram that if for a single fraction of a moment, I ever forgot you, or I ever considered to do anything but to please you, that let this body burn me. But if I have been for this entire 11 months completely chaste and pure and faithful for your pleasure and your service with my love for you, then this, by, this fire cannot burn me. The fire was blazing. She circumambulated the fire three times and then with folded hands she entered the fire. Ram was concealing his own emotions. His heart was totally breaking. When she entered the fire, even beyond his ability to restrain, tears started pouring from his eyes. And as she was in the fire, blaze surrounded by flames, Lord Brahma appeared on his carrier in the sky and proclaimed that Sita, completely pure, her chastity is the supreme emblem of her character. There should be no doubt. And suddenly, her body glowed, brighter than the fire, and Agni, the fire god, escorted her out and told Sri Ram that her heart and her love for you is pure. And Ram and Sita held hands. And then Ram, for the first time, looked in Sita's eyes. And Sita looked in Ram's eyes. And the total love of both of their hearts poured from each other's eyes into each other's hearts. And they stood silently. And Ram told Sita, not for a moment did I have any doubts in you. Do you think if I had any questions, I would have built that bridge across the ocean? I would have traveled across the length and breadth of most of India, searching for you, crying for you, yearning for you, longing for you? Would I have sent Hanuman to jump off of the sea and risk his life? But I had to do this because for all time to come, people should always know that your love is completely pure. And that even living in such a place as Sri Lanka, being harassed, threatened, intimidated, seduced, and tempted, by the greatest riches and the greatest powers in all the universe, not for a moment did you ever consider 
anything except how to please me with your love. There can be no doubt ever. When Ram was saying this to Sita, it was breaking his heart more than hers to say it, harsh words. But he did it so that she would be glorified for all eternity. And then it was time for Sita and Ram to return to Ayodhya. Ram again turned to Hanumanji. He said, my brother Bharat for the last 14 years has been ruling over Ayodhya. He's living as a hermit in Nandigram. He's putting my wooden shoes on the throne. But still, he has the power over Ayodhya, even though he's living in such a simple way as an ascetic. And in this world, on a subtle level, having power, having influence, it affects people. They get attached to it. I love my brother Bharat. If he has even the slightest inclination to keep that position, then I will remain in the forest, or I will be his sis assistant. But I don't want to take it away from him. Hanuman, you are expert at judging a person's heart. Go to Nandigram and tell Bharat that Sita and myself are reu reunited and we're coming back to Ayodhya. And if you sense even the slightest trace of sadness in his heart that he's going to lose what he has, then come back and tell me and I will not return. So Hanuman, with a loud roar of happiness, he cried out, Jai Shri Ram. And he jumped to Nandigram, which is on the outskirts of Ayodhya. It's a forest. And there was Bharat, dressed in tree bark, eating roots and herbs, living, living in a little straw hut, just like the one, even simpler than the one he saw Ram and, Laksh and Sita living in, in Chitrakut. And every day Bharat would come and give his report to the sandals of Ram that were sitting on the throne of Ayodhya. Hanuman gave the message to Bharat that Ram has been victorious in a battle with Ravana. He's reunited with Sita. The 14 years of his exile is over today. He's returning. Bharat, his eyes flooded with tears. He, his heart was dancing. He embraced Hanumanji. He said, every moment of every day for the past 14 years, I have only been yearning for this moment to come when Ram would return. And Hanuman could see that he was genuinely sincere. <laughs> Seeing the purity of Bharat's love, which was equal to the purity and chastity of Sita's love, Hanuman rejoiced. Hanuman embraced Bharat. <laughs> they were embracing each other and Bharat was saying, where is he, where is he? And Hanuman said, he's coming, any moment he will be coming from that direction. And a few seconds later, Bharat says, I don't see him, where is he? Bharat said, Hanuman said, he's coming, he's coming. After a few minutes, when is he coming? Are you sure he's coming? Hanuman said, he is coming, he is coming. And Bharat, every moment was like a yuga in his anticipation 
to see Ram again. Kosalya, Sutrugna, even Kaikeyi, after she was purified of her illusion, everyone in Ayodhya was simply breathing. Their hearts were only beating with the expectation for Ram to return. Where is he, Bharat? Are you sure he's coming? Hanuman said, Bharat, look in the horizon, the Pushpaka, Ram has come. And they danced together, weeping in ecstasy, chanting the holy names. Pushpaka came down to the simple hermitage of Bharat. Ram stepped down, still with his matted hair <laughs> and tree bark. And Bharat ran over to him to fall at Ram's feet, but Ram picked him up and the two brothers embraced. After 14 years of loving separation, they embraced. And Satrugna embraced his brother Lakshman. And the citizens of Ayodhya, so many of them had come to Nandigram to greet Ram. And in a little quiet corner, Kosalya, Ram's loving mother, was just watching Ram interacting with Bharat, Sudrugna, and the citizens of Ayodhya, crying in ecstasy. Ram ran over to her and touched her lotus feet, and she picked him up and embraced him. Thank you very much. G Media YouTube channel. Like, share, subscribe.